He was 58 years old and a colonel when the First World War broke out, and he had never seen active service. Yet within months, he was a national hero and a commanding general, and soon he would command the entire French army. I'm talking about Philippe Pétain. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War bio special about Marshal Philippe Pétain. He was born April 24, 1856 in Cauchy-Latour in northern France. His father was a farmer and Philippe had four siblings. His mother died the year after his birth. He attended a Jesuit middle school and high school and was noted as an intelligent student. Now, as a young adult, he took money his mother had left him and studied a year of philosophy before deciding on military school. Although in the preparation exam he finished 403rd out of 412, by the final he had dramatically improved his scores. In 1878 he joined the 24th Infantry Battalion as a second lieutenant. His career, for decades thereafter, was as a peacetime soldier. That career was branded as common or slow and it's true that it took him 35 years to become colonel, but only a minority of his contemporaries would achieve similar rank. Promotion opportunities are scarce in peacetime, and the French army was regularly shaken by political scandals. Pétain grew deeply mistrustful of politics. Pétain, as a commander, paid great attention to military drills. He was a strict disciplinarian, but a firm believer in good living conditions for the men. He also spent time as a military professor of infantry tactics, and was known for openly criticizing established doctrine in his classes. The French doctrine of all-out offensives said that the decisive factor in battle was morale. Collective maneuvers and massed infantry were necessary, and immobility was anathema as it hurt morale. Pétain taught alternative strategies. First off, he thought modern rifles were accurate enough to stop using group fire, which was a Napoleonic tactic. He thought individuals should be allowed to choose their targets. This seems obvious now, but it wasn't then and Pétain called the charges of dense infantry some sort of massacre game. But still, even as the war began, French doctrine held morale more important than superiority of fire, and dense infantry formations assured high morale. It wasn't that Pétain promoted just defense. He agreed that morale was the key factor, but he thought it came from having superior firepower, automatic weapons, and ground protection. So. He was a colonel in July 1914, and three months later was a lieutenant general and one of the few promising generals capable of changing French strategy. Even during his first action ever, August 15th, near Dinan, he showed he had his own style of command, coordinating infantry and artillery in his attacks. He soon benefited from the dismissal of hundreds of incompetent generals, many of whom had reached their positions by political favoritism. In just the first few months of the war, around 300 French colonels became French generals. Over the following months, as he became a hero, Pétain showed off his trademarks. Meticulous preparation, the essential role of artillery, attention to liaison, information and recon, use of new technology, and harsh discipline. It is the end of this glorious era where fighters still dared to confront face uncovered, where audacity and spontaneous reaction gave to the struggle its character of improvisation. The lessons of fire cannot be ignored anymore. From now on, war will change in its character. Material will take an ever more considerable place as factories will develop its power and quantity. In late October, Pétain was put in charge of the defense at Arras. He first reinforced the first and second trench lines. He also filed report after report to headquarters for more artillery, heavier artillery, more shells, something to match the Germans. Actually, he often disagreed with high command about priorities and how and where to attack. And because of his constant reports, many generals began to think that he was too cautious and too pessimistic. His command at Arras was marked by tough discipline. Men sleeping on guard duty were court-martialed, and stealing telephone cable was punishable by death. In January 1915, 40 men were caught mutilating themselves to avoid combat. He had 25 of them sentenced to death. 
Now, he did commute their sentence. They were instead sent into no man's land with their hands tied, which was just a delayed death sentence for most of them. On the other hand, he was aware of the hardships of the battlefield and wanted to give the men the best possible living conditions. So his supply chains were excellent and he had places for resting and washing in the trenches, which wasn't so common. He did order several failed offensives in Arras, but on May 9, 1915, his corps, reinforced with the Moroccan division and backed by heavy artillery, managed a successful attack all along the line, and the Moroccans even managed to take strategically important Vimy Ridge. The German reserves prevented a true breakthrough, but French Commander-in-Chief Joseph Joffre believed that with enough men and Pétain's method, a breach like that at Vimy Ridge could be exploited. Pétain shared this hope and was given command of the Champagne Offensive that September. It was a disaster. 28,000 French deaths and nearly 100,000 wounded for no real territorial gain. Poor weather had ruined aerial recon. The artillery preparation wasn't good enough. As usual though, the first German line fell, but taking the second was an impossible task. Pétain concluded that one offensive alone could not take out two lines of defense, and he now favored a war of attrition with small, meticulous operations. The defeat, though, did not erode confidence in Pétain, and in February 1916, he was tasked with holding Verdun against the German offensive. You can see what happened there in our regular episodes, but a couple of things here. Pétain, the logistician, organized the supply road, the sacred road, that moved up to 90,000 men and 50,000 tons of supplies per week in and out of Verdun. And when he saw the staggering death toll there, he organized a system where if a battalion lost a third of its strength, it was replaced. That's why 70% of the French army fought at Verdun. The Germans just topped up their losses. Pétain favored an active defense as usual, but as March rolled by, Joffrey wanted to go on the offensive, and in May, he had Pétain promoted out of the way in favor of Robert Nivelle. Pétain was a huge national hero by this time though his fame faded a bit when it was Nivelle who won back the lost ground at Verdun. But when Nivelle, who replaced Joffrey as commander-in-chief, created the disastrous offensive at Chemin des Dames in April 1917, which Pétain vehemently opposed, Pétain replaced him as chief of staff of the French army. Pétain's main challenge at that point was not beating the Germans, but dealing with a French army on the point of collapse. The failed offensive had provoked mutiny in the ranks, with many soldiers refusing to participate in another pointless attack. Research has shown that the revolts were in fact created by resentment against more all-out offensives, though many, Pétain included, believed they were caused by socialist and pacifist propaganda. The men, though, were committed to defending their positions, just no more stupid wastes of life like Chemin des Dames. Pétain used repression to deal with the situation, and 428 death sentences were ordered, and 2,870 jail sentences, half of them for over five years. But he also ordered relief measures to make soldiers' lives more bearable. Leaves were more regular, and guides were issued to soldiers on leave. Barracks were reorganized to make them more habitable, and food was provided in quantity and quality. By July, the collapse of the French army was avoided. Pétain would later call his work in 1917 more important than that at Verdun. Pétain's priority was to preserve his men long enough for American troops to arrive in force, so he ordered no major operations in 1917 and 1918. Critics began again to call him too cautious and to favor the optimism of Ferdinand Foch. Indeed, when the Germans broke through the French lines during their spring offensive in 1918, the writing was on the wall and Foch became commander-in-chief May 15th. Pétain's advice was still valuable though, but that I'll cover in 2018 when we get there. I also won't cover here the great controversy over Pétain's role in World War II, which you're going to look up as soon as this video is over. That is beyond this channel. I will say this, if the First World War had never begun, Philippe Pétain would be remembered by a few military historians as an early advocate of modern warfare tactics. However, since he applied his theories to the battlefield, he won many battles and his legacy 
is that of a gifted strategist and a popular leader. Although he would be stripped of all military honors and titles and sentenced to life in prison in 1945, this show is only concerned with his life and actions in the First World War. We'd like to thank Anatole Lamy for his research on this episode. If you want to learn more about another famous French general from World War I, you can check out our classic episode about Ferdinand Foch right here. And if you want to acquire our classic Foch U shirt or poster, you should also definitely visit our store. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.